there are several facts, right? Jellification of metals mm -hmm. and levitation. And uh, I, I mean, uh, is there anything I'm missing in terms of Hutchison effects, I guess? Well, there's uh, elimination of background yeah. radiation. There's that particular aspect of exploration we did. You mentioned something swirling around your arm once, right? Oh, yeah. That was kind of the invisible field that went around my arm, which felt like a twisting motion, like water, almost like heavy visualizing mercury going around my arm. Oh, okay. And then you actually felt a physical force there from it. Yeah. And then okay. I had a friend that actually could feel the fields with his hands. And then my boss there, Alex Pizarro, he felt weightless in one of the government setup labs. Oh, okay. Uh, what else? We've done all sorts of weird and wonderful things. We had things like uh, disappear and reappear and Things turn jellies, things shoot through the roof sometimes on a rare occasion. And so almost massive warping of time and space then, it sounds like. He would say that if you saw the areas. Yeah, the metal. side effects that fall out from it. Yeah, well, yeah. <clears throat> sometimes I have a metal piece that would simply just fall into a million pieces. Well, and you mentioned having I-beams melt also, right? No, or yeah. I-beams? Well, I thought you meant structural supports from the house once had melted. Or something like that. Uh, let me think. Uh, we've been to many different labs. Oh, we, yeah, yeah. We've had uh, the floor here was pulsating in 1999. Oh, okay. And that was kind of interesting unto itself. I was yeah. preparing for a demo for Fox TV. Pretty massive collection of effects then. Uh, yeah, actually quite an amazing amount that's been written up and cat categorized for the military. Yeah, George Hathaway did a lot of that, right? He yes. did a report on it. Yeah, full report. Yeah, but from what I hear, his experiments to replicate your effect haven't been that successful. Mm, no, it seems to fall in the areas of Ken Shoulders and some Richard Hull has mm, been able okay. to replicate some of the side effects like the metals and the invisibility factors that appear. Oh, sure, sure. Which is kind of intriguing. Yeah, and then the levitation almost seems nonlinear. It's like the amount of input power doesn't necessarily correlate to the, the size of the, the effect, right? Yeah, it's uh, 110 volts, four, four, what, 400 watts one time for uh, CTV News. Oh, okay. okay. Alan Edwards cut the cord by accident by closing this heavy steel door, and the whole lab went down, and everything went off, and then it was just one single out wall outlet. I used to operate all that equipment. Oh, wow. And it's still, levitation still happened, huh? Still happened. Hmm. It's Kai has got a lot of current limit, limiters and also capacitors. That, oh, uh, I see. So you were able to factor capacitors that minimize, the, yeah, minimize the input. It's quite interesting, though. Yeah. Because I have override yeah. switches. So when I did all the override switches, I blew the main transformer outside in the street. <laughs> Well, have you ever thought about doing conferences like the STAFE conference? Kind of an opportunity to talk to some of the like Lockheed and Boeing and government guys? Or? Oh, I'd love to do that. I love conferences. I did a lot in Japan. I did a few in the United States and Denver, Colorado and that. Oh, okay. So I just, somebody wanted me to ask because they thought about, you know, if they, if you were able to flying out sometime and speaking there. I'd love to. I've done, as I said, I've done a lot of that kind of thing. Even in Vancouver here I did once. Too. Oh, okay. I'd probably show video archives, metal samples, and that kind of thing. To show what I've done and some documentation. Yeah, absolutely. So levitation, jellification of metals, things disappearing and reappearing in other places. Um, Entire buildings disappearing, according to other people. Oh. i never seen it myself, but... Replication type stuff, you mean, or...? Uh, no, the actual building disappearing from plain view. I wonder if that'd be like a mirage effect, like really classic Philadelphia experiment stuff. Getting very close to that, Tim. I, I found on one of my old tapes just recently a metal sample turning transparent and reappearing. You can see that. Yeah, it, it's Absolutely. interesting to hear that these effects can be so similar, you know, and it definitely sounds like unified field theory effects. So almost like quantum mechanics stuff on a large scale. A lot of uh, theoretical scientists have applied theories to this technology now. But but a lot of them fall short, too. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. But, you know, it was first, actually, one report was made in 1983 for the U.S. Army Intelligence and was accepted by them. It was written up by Ferris Technologies and René Louis Vallée of France. The oh, famous, okay. famous um, neutron bomb discoverer. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. I have that report around somewhere, and I actually had it on my website, too, I think, parts of it. Well, are there any thoughts or comments on the Hutchison effect that people probably aren't aware of, do you think? or I think that it's very transitory. It seems to wander around 
As far as we can measure up to 300 feet, that was done by Los Alamos back in the 83. And in this experiments here, it seemed to go into those buildings across the street, causing doors to move around, dishes to move around, and other things to happen. Oh, so it is. it does kind of... I guess, go out much farther. Well, in terms of the replications, like George Hathaway's work, mm -hmm. do you think there's something they're missing? Do you think there's just like a trick to it? That, I mean, obviously it takes a lot of equipment, and it takes your breadth and depth of experience to set it up and operate it correctly, but uh, I don't know, have you ever had an impression that there was something that they just didn't do right? Oh, all the time. I When I see some of the experiments that they're trying to do, I notice that some of the coils and other components are not originally like original Tesla machines and a lot of it's commercial equipment. Oh, so they're using one-offs that may use digital instead of analog for some parts? Or... Yeah, you have to... This discovery was an ac accidental discovery in 1979. And, but, and you have to replicate the equipment era? The equipment era, which I did do, and then from then I went into different areas Backing out and going forward, backing out and going forward into X-band uh, transmissions and building where I could actually get more effects per hour, which I did accomplish in the late 80s. Mm, but this okay. took an extreme amount of energy in, in that, which I had have lots of energy in doing. But it also takes, um, like a good machinist, I guess I'm bragging now, but... No, not at all. I mean, it's you've been able to you something... fine tune and be very patient with these things. Yeah. Well, and that was a lot of what I thought with the lifter technology. It's... It's more about getting a feel for it than it is any scientific principles. You know, mm -hmm. the science is pretty straightforward in the case of lifters, and so it becomes more of a how do you build them, how do you do it in a precise manner. Yeah. You know? And I always felt like people kind of sold your expertise short, I guess, in that regard. They said, well, it's PK because we can't figure out how to do it. Well, maybe <laughs> they just can't figure out how to do it. You know, it's the kind of thing where a PhD may not help. It's the hands-on experience. Hands-on experience, um, fine-tuning and knowing all your equipment what its uh, faults are in that. And some of the faults can be environmental, such as uh, humidity in the air for ionic uh, transference. And oh, sure. Electrostatics and that. Well, you use a Van de Graaff, right, to kind of pump the background up to, to generate ions, and then Tesla coils is kind of a resonant offset, right? Yeah, and then I worked from then on into RF generations, and that, too, can be quite interesting because if it starts shifting... Well, and using Tesla's equipment at that frequency, that would be right along the lines of the Philadelphia experiment. Very close to it. I mean, with a vacuum tube tech, too, you have to take in consideration drift. Oh, yeah, and you have harmonics, right? Odd harmonics instead of even for the vacuum, yeah. vacuum tubes. And crystal phasing and phase, actual phase shifting of the some of the generators, which um, is very tricky stuff. Yeah, so in terms of funding, I mean, do you think, I don't know, a few hundred thou would be able to give you a big lab? Or well, it it's, would probably set the lab up and move everything out of here. Oh, sure. Sure, so a moving team and a good location. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. You need to uh, keep the progress running and reestablishing everything to a point where it's comfortable to operate. Oh, you have to warm it up, and turning it off is actually harder than just letting it run and putting it on standby, probably for tubes, right? Putting it in standby mode. Mm, it's okay once you get it running, preset. Oh, okay. Here, of course, it's so cramped, it's uh, by the time you get everything organized, you're totally exhausted. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, it's been it's exhausting just getting in, but it's still wonderful to see all this equipment and wonderful to kind of see you in the environment that's made you famous for your research. So yeah, it's, Well, it's kind of ended in 2003 or four when I did Griffin Films. Yeah, yeah. I managed to make some minor movement, but being an avid collector of things, too, seems to interfere with the fields and the fields seem to go are very transitory now to the point where the mayor of New Westminster came here and said well I'm getting complaints from con you know, concrete cracking and then citizens in distress so I had to actually start downplaying oh I don't even turn this stuff on is this for a show well there was a lot of confusion also and, because it was filmed, you did a, re a lifter replication, and a lot of people didn't understand that because there was a wire suspending it. The mm. point was, you were using a single wire transmission system to make a really heavy object move. Mm. And I think people confused that for really the classic Hutchison effect. Do you think that's just something um, that over time people will kind of forget about, or? I don't know, I seem to get an email once in a while, you know, screaming and yelling, you got wire attached to that thing, and I said, well, I was doing some also T Towns and Brown's work and the Hutchison effect combinations. Oh, where sure. I actually had vol high voltage on there. And also, there's the Griffin film one where I did have, literally have a string onto a toy UFO because simply 
we want to film something. If it's going to fly off, we're going to go spend time trying to find it over there or over there. So it's suspended right there. And you can see it where it starts to do its weird little movements. So if it was to actually go up in the air, too, it would just come back down the string and catch it by two cameras. Oh, sure. One, well, one right here and one over there, which Peter did do, actually. Now, in the case of, in the case of like, young people who might want to follow in your footsteps, what do you think the best thing for them to, to start out with would be? I think, actually, for them to study vacuum tube technology and, and actually, Tesla's work. Oh, okay, so Tesla and tubes, then. Tesla and vacuum tubes. I Somebody think that's also kind of related to the moray tube in some ways, right? Oh, well, the moray tube is quite an interesting area to get into, too. That's a whole different area of uh, alternative energy, actually. It's kind of like the pre, pre uh, transistor. Yeah, yeah. The, sh the Shockley came across with this was... But you're definitely open to working, do you think, with Boeing or Lockheed, as long as they kind of play fair, I guess? In terms yeah, of as long as I'm not locked down. And Like, I have walked away from contracts that I wasn't allowed to talk to anybody or show anybody anything. And that's what broke me away from the Ferris Tech Group. Oh, sure. The well, Canadian government guys, because I didn't want to live a life of secrecy. I didn't want to make that kind of stuff. I like to go out and... Well, as an inventor, it helps to be able to talk about things and, and get other people's opinions and ideas also and play off of your own internal intuition. Mm -hmm. um, now, in terms of John Alexander, I mean, do you, do you think the PK thing was a mistake? The fact that, quote-unquote, is psychic instead of being just your talent and skill? Well, no, John John just uses the PK thing as a, a national security mild whitewash just to nullify the uh, effects on their side of the fence, I guess, and also... If, on my side of the fence in a way it more or less harms me than it would hurt the military industrial complex. Sure, sure. But, but uh, they, you never know, now that they need this technology for all sorts of crisis situations, maybe they'll reverse their position on that. It could be. I mean, I've been the last year, I've been heavily phone called in from all over. Yeah. With yeah. people wanting tapes, videos, and things, that, which, which I do send out to them. Oh, okay. One directly to the Pentagon, one to Kennedy Space Center people, and SAIC down in San Diego, and many others. Yeah, yeah. What they do with it, they, they kind of disappear with it, but um, I guess they're, they ev evaluate it. And the whole premise when all this started with the military was that uh, I was told the Soviets had something similar, and John, if um, you should demonstrate it for us because... Oh, because that would we, offset the potential Soviet yeah. threat or whatever. Yeah, so I, I said to, to Hathaway and to Colonel Alexander, I said, oh, I see, okay, I got you. I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood all this stuff. I'm re relatively new at all of this kind of stuff, so I proceeded to do my best to present it in the rented lab by U.S. Army Intelligence at the time. So they'd rent you a lab and set the equipment up and then did you a disservice by calling it psychic. That's... You know, I well, the the one guy wanted to classify it, Bob Freeman. He wanted to classify everything. Well, the Los Alamos team wanted to go for it, and the Colonel wanted to go for it. So the Colonel got even by calling in later on uh, George Jack Hauke McDonald Douglas Aerospace Corporation, who did an unclassified report, as downgraded to PK. That's how they got it out into the. Oh, so that was actually a tool. <laughs> Pete, so so yeah, calling it psychic yeah, yeah. was a tool to keep it from being classified by the the Reagan administration, really. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. That makes sense. Well, you know, they had a lot of Cold War paranoia then, and I guess it's better to keep it open in one sense, so that you know people can come along later. And mm -hmm. and I guess in a, in a way that's paid off. You've done television and books and print all over the world. So. So in a strange sort of way, they, they may have really done you a service by cla calling it that instead of classifying it. I suppose so. And later on, of course, the Canadian government wanted it for themselves, and they were telling the U.S. government a lot of stuff like, well, it's a Canadian project, we want it, and kind of thing. So, But I never signed the papers through. I gave my demonstration, but never signed the papers. Well, and, in, and in the case of something like... Um, you know, if somebody did come along with the funding, if you set up your equipment, do you think you could fire the effect right back up? Oh, Given? yeah. I'm, I'm pretty ingrained with it anyhow. Oh, sure. I yeah. didn't think I could even make anything happen here in 2000 for Fox. Oh, but it, but it, it worked. It did work. It had a full field of levitation right to the ceiling, and it, these things fell down. They were very light objects, however. They were plastic things, like bottles and things. 
Oh, sure. Well, and it's then, still... Uh, they call it Ghost, Best Evidence Caught on Tape, aired April 29th. Oh, sorry. Well, in, in terms of... Um, I guess, because the other, the other thing was... Um, well, let me see. I was going to say, in, in terms of the 1980s stuff, um, you've had milkshakes, you've had things of all different types, so, so it, you can't really pin it down on being a magnetic or electrical effect in the normal sense. No, no, it's, uh, it's worked with wood, brass, water. Water is actually quite active in that area. Plastics that seem to go, actually the plastics will go in a spiral. Hmm. Around and around and around, which is caught on tape. Like, a lot of the television shows show the cannonball. Yeah. Or, or yeah. some other th weird stuff like the milk shake thing, but they don't go into the finer aspects of where you have a piece of plastic, like a plastic glass going around in circles, which I thought would be more applicable. Well, oh, in terms of media now, you've been capturing this. You have VHS tape, you have, uh, I guess, the you have Super 8 film, right? You actually have the old real real film that you've captured this on. Uh, Hathaway and Group has that. They made a video transfer for me. Oh, okay. And when I played it back frame by frame by frame, I did find the pieces that turned transparent, the metal pieces that you can see disappear and then slowly reappear. And oh, okay. My, I said to my webmaster, so you got to put that on, on there. So he managed to put one of the effects on there, but not that one. Well, if you have a tape that I could borrow, I could definitely dub this and then send you back the original. That okay. would work. Okay. So, well, I, I think I'm just about all set. Is there anything else that... Well, let's see. Are we going to do our duck shoot now with this thing here? Yeah. Oh, the, <laughs> yeah, again, it's neat to see a cannon in the in the house. Yeah, I don't know why. I'm into gunsmithing. But anyway, I think that that sort of covers it, although I did work with uh, the Boeing group, and that turned into a major fiasco, because I didn't want to go into another lockdown. Oh, sure. Um, well, I'm out of... Sorry, my... I'm actually... Would you, would you like them? They're tough. Like, really tough. If I use... <clears throat> because there's so much high voltage involved. If I used, uh... Uh, like, solid-state stuff, I would just override it and burn it up. But See, that's, that's one of the... Supposedly, one of these things, and they're, they're just in the... Tell me, uh, they're beyond experimental, but well, I'll I'll send the link and you can evaluate yourself. I'll okay, that'd be appreciated. If so. it's it would be applicable to handling rough currents and horrendous um, voltages, do you think? It's supposed to be. I don't know how hmm. how the initial initially available devices are, but the theoretical uh, high end is supposed to be able to replace. Um, valves in, uh, for instance, where I, where I came across it was in, in cellular base stations. Okay. Because uh, sometimes I'm pushing close to 400,000 volts. Oh, well, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Let me see. And if that's it's, that, that's low frequency stuff. Oh, so oh. that's a lot of energy. That's a lot. If you touch that, you're dead. Okay. Uh, and then in the big labs, I had up to that that was actually stored in capacitors. We talked about doing that with bomb stuff, but we had a hard time setting up the filter caps to keep out the you know the voltage overdraw. Like in my house, I think we have an 11 kilowatt limit on the breakers. Yeah. So, well, these things would take 60 minutes or sorry, uh, 60 seconds to load up. They were wow. plasma capacitors, low inductance type, and rated at 25,000 volts each. And I had many of them, and they're huge things. And I put them in series and parallel. Then they load up, and they would go off like a cannon going off yeah my railgun did that too did it? those caps yeah it's the you get that concussion in the air right it's whatever the width of the spark is and it's just bang yeah so yeah the, the railgun did that and shocked the heck out of me too because you don't expect it to make noise like that you know and then it does and it's like what the heck just happened oh yeah are they what are how big are these things the capacitors no not the caps the the tubes i mean do you have like big gold giant tubes uh, no, no, I have eight, the 801s. Oh, the, well, the capacitors I once no, had, I don't use them anymore, but they were about 15 high, about a foot a in diameter guy. round, and weighed 100 pounds each. I might just be this point and the biggest one I had was a 1,000 pounder. That is huge. Well, I know, just, I got them from UB. That's fun in its own right. Uh, no, I got from uh, Headley Rendell, who oh, owned oh, RP oh, Electronics and Forth. I still know him. He still drops around. He had these in his garage, and he gave them to me back in the 80s. 
Oh, I, I was going to... So, I had a lot of fun with the old X-ray transformers that pushed 200,000, 400,000 volts DC. Mm. Get out of the scrapyard, and they weigh around almost 2,000 pounds. Scrap people don't want them. They deliver them, say, you can have that. <laughs> oh, thank you. Because <laughs> it's perfect. I was going to ask about Ted Gagan, remember? Because I had both of you on at the same time, and it seemed like... There was a lot of overlap. I didn't even understand most of it. But when he was talking about beard and stuff, mm -hmm. like the quantum potential envelopes, it sounded like he had a practical implementation of Tom Bearden's ideas, but it also sounded like it explained some of the effects from the Hutchison effect. With Tom Bearden's work, it, um, like Tom's, I've known Tom since the early 80s and uh, seen his publications where he uses like radar interference systems. Yeah, that would be very similar to the, the field overlap, right, from your systems. And I, I, I recall when he was talking about these, what do you call, uh, cold hole, I think, explosions out in the atmosphere and that, and the new, normal media was reporting these things all the time. Hmm. And these clouds and standing calmer ways and that, and I could understand, Tom, where he was coming from with that stuff. Yeah, it made some sense to me having studied Tesla, but... There were parts of it that I just wasn't sure about. Mm -hmm. So, But the thing that I liked about Gagnon's work was the frequencies themselves changing states of matter. I thought that would explain the jellification. You know, I, I mean, I'd almost wondered if it was electron orbitals, but um, apparently Hathaway felt something similar and just wasn't able to make it work in his replication. So. Yeah, it's you know, the closest person to that is Ken Shoulders. Oh, with the charge clusters. Charge so clusters, again, it yeah. goes back to the electrons themselves. Maybe they're being moved out of position, changing the chemistry of the elements. I think we're we're very close to something because I had a visitor from Switzerland coming out who represents a very large company. And we're talking about all these things. He knows uh, Hal Fox, Ken Shoulders, and the other scientists. And yeah, I met Hal at the conference. Oh, he's a cute, cool guy. Yeah, he's Hal's fun. Yeah, he... I met him in 97 at a conference down in L.A., and that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I, when I did that, I spoke at Tesla Tech this summer, and, and the first question from the audience was Hal standing up saying, do you want help with lifters from E.T.? It's like, how do you answer that? You know, <laughs> well, thanks, Hal. Sure, if they want to drop by. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Hal, is, he's got a sense of humor, too. Yeah, I know. He was toying with me. <laughs> yeah, he loves doing that. Yeah, you know, so I, you know, it was fun. It was fun to kind of break the water, I guess, or break the ice, or whatever they call it. So. That'd be hell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember in, in L.A. there in 97 with, um, it was uh, hosted by a bank, um, banker, a banker lady by the name of Susan Banner and Linda McLean in Glendale, and there was about 30 of us giving different topics, and Ken Shoulders was talking about his stuff. Mm, a lot, okay. and then I gave my thing, I just put a VCR in the video machine, so well, this is what I do kind of thing, and sort of self-explanatory when you're doing CTV news stories and yeah. that kind of stuff, I said it's kind of self-explanatory, and then I go and talk about metal samples. Sure, and, sure. And um, then there was many others, Dan Winters, I believe, and others, like Brian O'Leary, a friend of mine, that uh, mm -hmm. gave his stuff. Well, where do you think the Hutchison effect will be going in the next few years? Is it building towards... You'd mentioned a Swiss person involved with it, mm -hmm. possibly. And it well, the Swiss people feel that it could be used for getting rid of hydrocarbons and having mm. devices that can float around without producing hydrocarbons. And this was the idea also of McDonnell Douglas Aerospace's Jack Houck. Mm. He said he had okay. ideas, and he predicted where those frequencies would interact in his report. So Jack Hank would be a good report to get to study up on, on kind of how this stuff works. In a way, but it's in, uh, again, it's uh, deactivated by, it has PK through it. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, you have to... <laughs> you have to kind of read between the lines. I have, like, hours of tape where um, Alex Pizarro talks along with him about all the other scientists. And what happened was that uh, the Pentagon people brought out this blue unopened object to Jack Hank to put it in the field. Mm, okay. It, he didn't know what it was. And I said, I recall saying, is it radioactive? And Jack Huck says, I hope not. <laughs> they gave him quite a number of supplies to bring out to test in the field. Oh, I see what you mean. And yeah. then some of them did stuff, some of them didn't, and nobody knew one way or the other. Yeah, the un blue unopened object, we didn't know what it was. And whatever happened in D.C., we don't know to this day. But uh, 
the report itself is uh, it's six hour long videotape shows a lot of interesting effects and also that's the report itself shows some very interesting diagrams and it's classified report now no it's was never classified oh okay Colonel Alexander wanted that to be open as PK yeah yeah well you know and with reference After, numbers uh, we could probably even dig up some of the classified stuff so. oh yes I would love to find those tapes yeah in the US government and Canadian especially that they would be uh, probably located in, at DSTI headquarters. That's the Directorship of Scientific Technical Intelligence in Ottawa, Canada. Oh, okay. Now, do you know where the U.S. ones might be? The U.S. Uh, tapes? Oh. Could be close to Colonel Alexander. Oh, okay. Could be close to him. Okay. I phoned the Pentagon back in the late 80s, and they were searching around for the tapes. It was uh, Stan Pulser and Steve Sardi who were civilians there and said, well, it's kind of empty in this building these days and said, we tried to find those tapes and documents because Colonel Alexander moved out of there to Los Alamos for his non-lethal weapons. Yeah, I talked to him about those too. Cause, yeah. Because of the Marine Corps project. So. And that uh, I suggest perhaps it, they said to me, that uh, it prob all this stuff probably went into the burners, but however, you can check with your Canadian counterparts. Oh, okay. Okay, so, so it was a DCIST in Ottawa, I said? Uh, this is DSTI. DSTI. Director of Scientific Technical Intelligence in Ottawa. Uh, 